Good evening and welcome to our continuing Black Festival, Black History Festival. Tonight, our conversations on street art in the African-American community. I want to welcome everyone to our second program. And this program will feature a discussion between Chanel Compton from the Executive Director of the Banneker Douglas Museum. I know she has another last name, so I apologize. It's not in my notes, but I'd love for you to introduce yourself fully. And we will also have in conversation with her visual artist and painter Cedric Michael Cox. They will be discussing the impact of street art in the black community. Our first panelist is Chanel Compton Johnson. There it is in my notes. I have to apologize. I'm not Dr. Lopez Matthews. I'm Ida Jones, subbing for him as a member of the Asala TV uh, community. And so we want to thank him for his programming and just to really get through the evening on tonight. Chanel is inspired and passionate about her role as the executive director for the Banneker Douglas Museum and the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture. Chanel has been a lifelong supporter of museums, stating a museum can be such a powerful place as a young person. It was my first, my initial visit to the museums and the galleries that opened my eyes and mind to new perspectives, cultures, and history. African-American museums are instrumental in inspiring a new generation of leaders and innovators because it's a place of empowerment, of learning, and a place of individual and collective transformation. As executive director, of the Banneker Douglas and the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture. Chanel is dedicated to serving the great state of Maryland to amplify and support African American heritage, initiatives, groups, and museums to gain further access to resources, partnerships, and reach new audiences and heights. Chanel earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Rutgers University and completed a graduate degree in art management from American University. She's also a visual artist expressing Black diasporic experiences, history, and identity through portraits, abstract paintings, and mosaics. She has a home and art studio in Baltimore, Maryland. Our second panelist is Cedric Michael Cox, who is best known for his paintings and drawings that merge surrealism and representational abstraction. As a student of the University of Cincinnati College of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning, DAP, Cox was awarded a fellowship to study at the Glasgow School of Art in Scotland. After receiving his Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Painting in 1999, he began to exhibit regionally and nationally. Cox's paintings catapult color and rhythmic action with abstract and recognizable images that create compositions inspired by themes in music and the natural world. His work remains true to sharing Cox's innermost self as passion radiates from his canvas working under several influences, which include architecture and art history. Cox's work ranges from geometric to curvilineal to floral-like forms, all dancing within surrealistic shapes. In addition to his work being in corporate collections, Cox has executed several large murals in various public and private schools in the Cincinnati region. At this, oh yes, okay. So what we're gonna do first is have Ms. Johnson go and share her slides and conversation. Then Mr. Cox will go next and then we'll open up the floor for conversation. Please use the chat as well for conversation too. Thank you, Chanel, the floor is yours. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Jones. It's so great to be here um, with Morgan's Finest. <laughs> and, um, and I'm so uh, enthused to learn more about um, Cedric, your work. Um, so I'm going to start my slides and talk a little bit about myself as a, as a public artist and my work um, with um, the public art uh, community in the DMV area that includes uh, street artists as well. Um, so just a, a few pillars. Let me just start by saying I do not consider myself um, a street artist, though um, I have worked with other street artists who um, definitely work within like commission public art projects uh, really throughout the world. Um, so when I think about street art, I think about, um, and sometimes people use public art and street art interchangeably, um, which is totally fine. Um, how I kind of think of it is, you know, street art being like typically doesn't have much of a budget um, and artists typically um, challenges like pro what is property, right? Uh, within like the public domain and um, they typically um, will challenge um, 
kind of like mass consumerism or um, um, maybe religion, um, or they'll have like other political statements. Like if you think of like artists like Keith Haring in New York, his um, work was to educate the masses around the AIDS crisis. Um, uh, but he would get arrested at times, in his, especially in early on in his career um, when he would produce his work. Um, same thing if you think about the young artist Basquiat and his Samo, um, cre I don't know why I did that, but his Samo creations um, in New York. Um, so um, yeah, so I would, I, re I recall being at different like mural jams or what have you and other, another artist friend um, got arrested and I was like, oh my God, like why? But we had a license to be there. So, I, so I say that to say, I don't have the, the chutzpah to be a street artist, but I have worked within the, the public art sphere, which when you think of public art, those typically are like commission pieces you know, you have permission from the property owner to produce the work. So some of the three pillars that I work from um, within my work as a public artist is definitely around, and not to say street artists don't work within this, these pillars as well, because um, there is a lot of community building around street art. Um, but some of the pillars that I work on is community building and connection. Um, I, as an executive director of a museum and an arts administrator and an educator, I love um, making opportunities um, uh, for artists to show their work and getting resources to artists, paying them for their commissions and work. Because it's hard being an artist and it's expensive um, producing your work. So um, I, I really do love that. And of course, the third is um, sharing Black history. That has been a love of mine for the bulk of my um, life as an artist. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm just going to talk about back in the day. Back in the day, this is my high school graduation picture. Um, I wasn't that great. In, well, I wasn't that interested in school, um, but it wasn't until high school that I became, you know, I kind of found my voice as a leader, as an artist. Um, I went to a very poorly funded school. Well, I did. I mean, compared to other schools in Connecticut, it was a poorly funded school, but had amazing teachers that really took me under their wing, one of which was my art teacher who took us on field trips um, in New York and throughout the metropolitan area. Um, one trip in particular that I remember was the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where I learned and saw the work of Leonardo Drew, who was an African-American artist from Bridgeport, Connecticut, like me, um, and who graduated from my high school, and he had his work at the Met. Um, and I remember seeing his installation um, and it was huge. I mean, it was massive. And it was like all these found objects. You can kind of see them on the, in the corner of the screen. He works with found material, wood. And the piece that I saw was like mixed, like wood, found wood and cotton. And he was referencing black labor in the United States. Mind you, I'm 16, 17. I didn't know what I was looking at really, but I knew it was something that was powerful and magical and spoke to history, black history in a way that I never seen um, within this large scale. So I always liked this thing big. Like I just love massive art, you know, since, 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 a, since a young end. So next slide. Um, so I graduated from high school, well, graduated from high school, obviously went to college, got a BFA in painting. Um, and then I moved to DC and I didn't, really know anybody. Uh, well, first I moved to Maryland, then I moved to DC. Didn't really know anyone. Um, I taught art. I waited tables for years and I was really just trying to make it happen as an artist. And I joined an arts collective um, called Abbas Cabas. It was a collective of street artists and public artists. And we would get commissions to do gigs throughout, you know, typically the DC area. Next slide. So while I was waiting tables, I was getting my master's degree in arts management. I was waiting tables at Bus Boys and Poets um, and on 14th and V Street. And um, I was like, tag, you know, I really want to have a show, but where am I going to show my work? You know what I mean? Like I'm newly, gra didn't, you know, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any real networks. So I asked the owner of the um, restaurant, I was like, his name's Andy Shalal. And I was like, Andy, you know, do you have any alternatives? I learned what alternative art spaces was while I was in school um, getting my master's. So I was like, do you have like an alternative art space that I can use to like show my work for a show? 
He was like, yeah, I have this gutted out space, industrial space, and I'm going to turn into a restaurant. You can have that. It was right next door, went next door, saw the space. It was huge. It was massive. And I was like, my work cannot fit in this. Like, I don't know, like maybe a little corner. I don't know. So one person that I knew, she was a, now she was a street artist. Her name was Alicia Cosnahan, AKA Decoy. She would do wheat paste all throughout DC. And she was a part of Abbas Calvis, who I would later become a part of that art collective. And I was like, Alicia girl, we taught art together in this after school program. I was like, Alicia girl, let's do a show together. And she was like, okay. And then she came back and she said, let me invite my friends um, and we can all do like a show a public art show like just let's just paint on the walls and i was like oh my gosh that's the, the best idea andy agreed and he asked if we could if all the murals could acknowledge and pay homage to zero no hurston um many of you should know that zero no hurston was an author in the harlem renaissance and that was what the restaurant was themed after and we all love the idea now mind you we're all young so we didn't really know about like we should be getting paid for this. I mean, we did get paid a little bit, but it was like, we were doing it just for the love of it, right? So I was basically the curator of that project. And that was the first big project that I ever did. And that was the first time that I really had that high of like, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to curate or be a part of spaces around collective art making. Um, and so... All of the artists, it was like 21 artists, all of them I didn't know. Like, these are all folks, like we did a call out and they came, we like just jammed out. We learned about Zora Neale Hurston and they all had different interpretations of her visually, which is so fantastic. Some of them are street artists, some of them are fine artists, but it was just so amazing. And Andy, of course, ended up keeping the murals. Um, the restaurant ended up closing some years later, but we still have some great archival uh, images of the murals that you can see here um, on this screen. So again, I found that high and I was like, yeah, let's, this is what I'm going to do. So next slide. Um, so um, as part of Alvis Calvis, we would start doing mural jams in DC. So mural jams is basically a call out to, you get a permission from a property owner to, it could be like a long wall or something like that. Um, and invite a bunch of graffiti artists and uh, public artists to come out and you get a section of the wall and, you know, you eat, drink, listen to music, and you literally just spend the whole day painting a mural. So on the right hand side, that's one that we did on uh, like off of Rhode Island Avenue. And on the left hand side, that was a public art installation that we uh, did on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, which was a lot of fun. So I, I just wanted to show you that. Um, just me actively making the piece of work. And it, it was one of the best times. That period was one of the best times of my life art artistically. All right, next slide. Then I decided, well, damn, I need a real job, right? <laughs> I mean, I need to make pay bills, right? You know, I had this degree. So I <laughs> um, I was, I love, I really enjoyed working at Bus Boys and Poets, but because, um, you know, that's where I kind of like met other artists and things like that. Um, and I enjoy working with Albus Calvis, but I was like, I have this degree. Like, I really want to start working in museums because I love museums. I've interned at museums during my undergrad and graduate program, and I love museum education. So I uh, ended up working as the education coordinator at the Prince George's African American Museum. And really how they looked at the education coordinator, they were like, okay, girl, like, go do those docent tours, like do some tours, you know, do some programs here and there. And I was like, no, it could be more, you know? So I started applying for funding and really engaging with the public arts community that I knew in the DMV area to do public art projects with young people in Prince George's County. One of which led to um, um, uh, American, Alli so American Alliance of Museums funded a public art project where we took our youth after school program to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, where they learned about Afro-Brazilian culture. You can see on the right-hand side of your screen, um, we did a public art installation in their museum. And we also did uh, a mural. The children from, um, from Brazil, most of which were Afro-Brazilian, came to the United States um, and learned about um, 
Black leadership in Prince George's County. And we also painted a mural as well. And that was just an incredible, that was a year long project and it was such an incredible experience. Um, so again, it was just, I found something else I can get high over. You know, I keep on saying high, but you know what I mean, okay? So next slide. Um, and now with my, as the executive director of the, the Maryland Commission on African-American History and Culture and the Banneker Douglas Museum, which is Maryland State Museum on Black History, um, I still, everywhere I go professionally, I would incorporate some type of public art project, right? Um, so we, um, 2020, 2020, excuse me, was the um, um, 100th anniversary I'm sorry, 2019 was the 100th anniversary of the um, Women's Suffrage Act, as well as um, the uh, anniversary, 100, 150th anniversary, I think I'm getting these numbers wrong, of the 15th, um, 15th uh, Amendment. So you're, okay, Dr. Jones, am I right? Okay, all right. So we did a, a public art um, project where we invited 21 Maryland-based artists. Now the trip is finding black Maryland-based artists in like in droves is was slightly challenging because a lot of the commissions that were offered, like the bigger commissions, were offered to non-black artists in the DMV. So that I thought was really interesting. Even the works that featured black people, like if you look in Baltimore City, I mean it's I don't, I don't want to say most of them, but some of them are from non-Black artists. So I was like, where's the Black public art community? So that was a great project because it connected um, um, emerging public artists with well-to-do established artists like Ernest Shaw to build this network within Maryland. And some of which, after the project, they continue to work together. On the right-hand side, you'll see the work of Brandon Donahue. All of the murals that we created that celebrated the Black vote, we end up donating to schools and community centers throughout Maryland. On the right-hand side, Brandon Donahue is um, creating um, a mural featuring uh, Fannie Lou Hamer while she was in DC. And that mural was um, donated to the Harriet Tubman Cultural Center uh, in Howard County. And his this piece was actually featured in High Allergetic Arts Magazine um, this month. So it, the show the show is still getting promoted. Um, next slide. My work now, I um, primarily do paintings and mosaic. This is the piece uh, that I did um, commissioned by Maryland Public Television, and it was installed at the Harriet Tubman Cultural Center in Cambridge, Maryland, and it was inspired by Harriet Tubman's um, experience um, at the Bucktown store, where an overseer threw a three-pound weight at her head um, that almost killed her, um, but after that, she received religious um, um, visions of being a leader and um, a freedom fighter. Uh, next slide. The next project, this project that I'm working on now is to create a mural or a mosaic, depending on, on how much can be raised, um, of Leah Brock McCartney at George Washington University. Uh, Leah Brock McCartney was the first African American woman to uh, graduate from GW shortly after the school integrated in the 1950s. Um, so the work references um, Making Lemons Out of Lemonade, which was the name of the course, um, the Black feminist course that um, Dr. Jordan West uh, taught to her students, which inspired this mural. Um, and then the Combe River Collective, um, which was inspired by Harriet Tubman, was a Black feminist movement. Um, and that's one of their iconic quotes around, um, nobody is free until Black women are free, pretty much. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, so I'm really excited about that project. Hopefully we get started soon, but we are currently fundraising uh, to raise funds for its installation. And you can, next slide. Okay, well, you can follow me on social media, all the things, Chanel and Johnson. And um, I probably went over time. I apologize. Um, but <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I see you. Put my ad handle there. Your turn, Cedric. You're up. Cool, cool. Well, my name is Cedric Michael Cox, as you guys can see. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I'm very, very grateful to be considered uh, a part of the street art family, even though my background in the visual arts or in murals are more or less uh, more of the 
more traditional aspects of getting permission, getting permits, and not you know, not the uh, the real in the street work of of the graffiti artist. But I've been very fortunate to be a part of many many great projects, and I'm going to share some of them with you. Um, I guess since the very beginning of me creating art, uh, there's always been this need to want to share what I'm creating and what I'm doing. And this began back in the first grade. Okay, I went to a predominantly white school. I was the you know the, the the raisin in the jar of mayonnaise, and I just did not know where I fit in or whatnot. And but we had this project. I didn't think I was going to talk about this, but I said, "What the hell? Let's talk about it." Okay, uh, where we had to take a, a standard you know image of a bear, a teddy bear or whatever, you know, and as a, as a former educator, I know the whole process, draw the circle kids, draw the, the, the oval, draw the, the ovals for the, for the legs. And so every kid, once we did that, the whole game plan was you to actually personalize it. So I personalized my bear as like some Viking King Arthur warrior Conan barbarian thing. Anyway, the whole point is I colored everything to the edge of the paper. There's an intensity as far as the foreground and background with these oil pastels that I, where I created my work. So the art teacher set me aside and, and honored me and really praised me and shared with the other students who I am and what I do. And from that moment in time, from that moment, I actually got this confidence to share what I do and how I do it. And so my mom is a school teacher. So basically I guess that gene is in me, that desire to want to share, to want to teach came out. And so I've always, identified the praise and respect I've gotten as an artist as a means for me not only to be financially successful at it, but as a way to express myself, of course, and just to succeed and keep my sanity. So this is what I do. Um, we can start with the first slide. I, I, I don't think any of these are in order, but we'll jump around and that's totally cool. Uh, this is a mural I did back in the courtyard of a school in 2000 and I believe 21, I believe 2021. And it's at Marymount School. And these are the kind of partnerships that have developed through the art that I make as an abstract painter and the vividness of my work to be able to go into various schools within suburban areas, urban areas, and just all around this greater Cincinnati area and share my work um, on different levels to many different students. And so this is a fun project. It was amazing. Um, and I'll, I'll just never forget the experience. Uh, they, they, it's wonderful when you go into schools that allow you to do what you do. I've done murals that are not going to be featured in this presentation where they wanted me to gear my ideas towards education, towards various themes that maybe didn't fit my, my credentials or criteria. But it still is a learning experience because you're just doing it and you're stepping out of your comfort zone. So this one, yeah, it's a garden piece and it's fun. I just, I just love it. I mean, I would just you know, I, I hang around kids and going to a school all the time and not teaching or anything. They'll probably think I'm strange or something like that. But I'd love to like just hang out there one one summer and just vegetate, maybe work on other works of art while I'm hanging out there. But anyway, next slide. Uh, this is a piece that I designed um, for this company called Artworks. Artworks is an agency here in Cincinnati, Ohio. And maybe some of you guys uh, have heard about it. We, they've gained a lot of uh, national recognition. Uh, my first mural I did for them was back in 2009. Then I did another mural back in 2011. And I have a good reputation uh, uh, with them. And they asked me to design a mural for the community of Walnut Hills for the Man's Hotel. Uh, Walnut Hills is one of the earliest neighborhoods like Avondale in Cincinnati, Ohio. As you're coming up the hill from downtown, we're, we're a city that's on the water, on the river. Uh, you know, with Cincinnati and then across the river, of course, Covington, Kentucky, Newport, Kentucky. Uh, so there's a lot of black entrepreneurship that is in the Walnut Hills area, the history of it. So I'm capturing that in this particular mural. Now, the previous slide that you just saw was what I worked on while they worked on this mural and I just solely designed it. But it's a positive image. It's really cool. Kids can really dig it. I'm, I'm very proud of it. Uh, a lot of people, when they know my work or look at my work, they catch my work online, they, they get they're surprised when I do something figurative. But I do do figurative work. Um, I'm into the Art Nouveau period of time where the figure is an accessory to the beauty of geometric shapes and forms and not necessarily a function of um, with a message. It's just, you know, that's what I do. Um, but or maybe that's how I just use the form. I, I think every work of art has a message and has a meaning, meaning behind it. Uh, with every pose, but 
yeah, on the next slide. Now, this is exciting. This is really cool. Uh, there's a community in Avondale. Uh, now, now, I've mentioned the word Avondale a lot. For some reason, um, Avondale has been a place, and more specifically, there's a street in Cincinnati, Ohio called Forest Avenue. Okay, uh, there's a street called Reading Road that takes you from downtown all the way up to uh, as far as uh, maybe Mason, Ohio, and some of the rural areas of Ohio. But this street, the first neighborhood you go to or, or end up in um, is uh, Avondale, okay? And for some amazing reason, I've had so many projects in Avondale, whether it's the South Avondale School um, or it's the murals on the street. It's a predominantly African-American community, once German, then Jewish, now it's African-American. Um, and so I have a rich history. There's, the, of course, children's hospitals in the area, and I've done several projects with the kids in the schools for the hospital and whatnot. But this particular mural is one of those magical moments where they just ask you to just do your thing. Uh, there's this comp there's this subdivision or group of townhomes called White Oak Townhomes. Now it's called White Oak Townhomes. Before it was called Colonial Village. And it was run down. It was really rough. It was really bad. Poor management. Kind of just people, people's houses were leaking. Everything was run down. So this company, this realty company, decided to do a massive makeover for this community and for this area. Um, and this company, the promotional company out of New York called Entrepreneur, called me up and asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, yes. And so what ended up happening was me creating these works of art inspired by uh, Afrocentric quilt patterns, specifically the Northern Star quilt pattern that you'll see in the two larger murals, the one on the top left and the bottom right, that symbolizes, you know, our, our journey, our achievement, our arrival. And it's, it's just fun. It's, I just had so much fun working on these. It was just a vacation. And, um, and if you move to the next slide, uh, that's just me, whatever. Let's go move on. Sorry. Anyway, now this is a slide of me working with a youth who's taller than me now. Uh, this was back in 2020. And this kid's amazing. He just got a, um, I believe his name is Jeff. He just got a commission for a, for Fifth Third Bank. He's actually doing a, a painting for Fifth Third Bank. He has a great circle of uh, family members and art artists like myself around him, encouraging him. But this is just a good shot of me working on the Black Lives Matter mural that happened in 2020. Um, it was an amazing experience, and we'll get back to that with the, with the next slide. I'm, I'm probably these are, these are a little bit out of order, but this is just I'll, I'll talk more about it. But it was just a wonderful experience meeting new people, meeting new up and coming African American artists in our community here in Cincinnati, and just watching how this organization that uh, that started and and developed from the Black Lives Matter mural. And this to me, this is street art. This is obviously you're working on the street, but it's a message. It's actually saying something politically, you know, Black Lives Matter and very, very, uh, and at a time we needed it. This is right during the pandemic. I should have my mask on. He should have his, but we didn't care. We're painting. We're doing our thing. And if you go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, this is a commission for, I did for a library in Dayton, Ohio. Um, it was, it was a great opportunity. Um, and this is going to be actually in a book coming up where it was a partnership with the Dayton Art Institute and local artists and the library to actually have artists communicate and do works of art relating to what they um, what they what they liked in the museum. And the next slide we'll show you is the first one I did for the Dayton project. This particular piece was inspired by Bantu culture and some of the artifacts of of, of their Western um, West African. Um, tribal collection, as well as the artwork of Norman Lewis, a well-respected African-American abstract painter who's obviously no longer with us from the 40s. And he's actually attributed to being not necessarily the first abstract expressionist artist, but actually one of the one of the primary movers within that movement. And he just unfortunately was not recognized amongst uh, Pollock and all the other artists for obvious reasons. But when you look at the breadth of his work, the dedication, the drive and a commitment to color, shape, and form. Him like Hale Wood Woodward um, or Woodford, 
you would just see that they are right on time, if not better than the Kooning and all those other cats. Uh, we want to move to the next slide. Thank you. This is my most recent mural. Now let's. Now we're not going to go back in slides, but if you remember that that mural, that image of four shots of the housing, that was that was where I had a north northern star quilt pattern. While I was working on that mural, they were constructing this big hill across the street. Now across the street from that subdivision is the Cincinnati Zoo, and when they had the big concrete wall. The people at the zoo were like, man, we need to have something hot that's over in the community over there in the subdivision. So they commissioned me the next year, which was this past summer, to do this large mural for the new elephant house. Uh, but this interesting thing about this, this is not for the people at the zoo. Uh, zookeepers can check it out. The elephants can check it out. But this is to the Avondale community. Um, this is the, the zoo has had a partnership with the people of Avondale, the community of Avondale. And like my relationship with Avondale, they believe in the community. They feel like they're a part of the community. They made the resting place within the middle of the community. So this is a tribute to the vibrancy of what they hope the community will thrive to become. It's, it's a tribute to them um, through the colors and vivid um, landscape and whatnot. So yeah, that's, 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 that's what that particular image is. And the next one. This is the Black Lives Matter mural from an aerial view. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this project. There are 17 artists, okay? And we all were given the theme into three colors, red, black, and green, okay? And a lot of these artists I met for the first time. Some of these artists I've known for years. But this is all an idea from this woman named Atlantis Powell who is the founder of Black Art Speaks. Now, Black Art Speaks happened after this mural was uh, devised and created. She made a poem called, We Want What You Want. And in this poem, there's a particular line that addresses a social issue and concern regarding our community as African-Americans, specifically Black Americans, and what we, um, what we want, what we bring to the table. And this is in the middle of the George of the, the heat with George Floyd. This is this is our response. And man, the city got behind us. The city of Cincinnati got behind us. Um, some of the major arts organizations within the city helped and assisted. But the core design and everything was us. And we had a lot of people from all around assist us with this. But the thing about it is um, my my section of the mural is the letter E in matter. And it's for, we want to raise our family in a peaceful area. You can tell, you know, I, I, I the swirly shapes and whatnot and the compositional breakup, that's my signature work over there. But it's it's been an amazing journey for Black Art Speaks because, because of this mural, because of our execution, because of our dedication, because of our leadership, um, we have been able to obtain other contracts in the urban areas of Cincinnati, Ohio, where we did a remodeling of, where they were doing a remodeling of one of the urban parks in the area. They, we did some work on basketball courts, but I don't, I don't have aerial shots of that. Um, and also we're taking in certain communities, the R I believe in matter and the A uh, in matter are going to um, be in the community once again of Avondale. Um, and no, sorry, the R is gonna be in Roseline. That's where I live. Uh, we have a home, my wife and I have a home in Avondale and Roseline. But um, but basically, the cool thing about this mural, it keeps giving back. Uh, I just want to touch on a few things with this mural. Uh, the R and the A, like I said, are going up. The R is going up in April. The May is going up. And they're going to be these big concrete, I believe they're going to be concrete or fiberglass monuments that are going to stand in these communities. And the people of the community are going to be able to create and paint on these beautiful works of art. And along with that, we're going to have programming relating to gun violence, gun control, uh, mental health. And we're going to be doing a lot of other side projects that are going to help just keep the community involved and a part of the art making experience. So um, yeah, it's really exciting. And if you want to hit the next uh, slide, that's another, that's my section of the letter. Um, and yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. The cool thing about this, I think the most remarkable thing, our mayor 
who was in office prior to the mayor we have now was on a conference call with the mayor of Detroit uh, or on an NPR News mayor of Detroit, I believe Dallas and another city. And they all asked them what they're doing to support or to um, rectify the civil unrest that's going on in their cities. What are they doing to make changes? And a lot of them talked about meetings. A lot of them talked about really positive things. But our mayor literally said, we have a mural outside of City Hall that says Black Lives Matter. And that's what we're doing right now. And I was driving to the first day for the, on the mural when our mayor said that. That made me very proud that Cincinnati, with its population of 40 Five percent African American. I say it's fifty because not everybody takes a consensus consensus thing. Uh, does uh, that has this, and it's amazing. I love it. I'm very proud. I love my city, and I can't wait for us to do more in the city with the Black Lives Matter message. We repaint the mural almost every year. We're going to do more, and it's just a blessing. So um, that's my experience. Now, my like I said before. Uh, my participation in street art is more conservative in the sense that I'm not, you know, at, out at night <laughs> doing, doing uh, in certain areas, uh, watching out for, you know, uh, the cops or anything like that. I've done stuff like that before, but it's it's a traditional method of how we get the funding. It's a traditional traditional method of how I get these commissions. But I think in the end, when we are addressing the issues of the community and the community respects what we're doing and we're getting their feedback of what they want to see on their walls. It's making the art experience more communal. Uh, Cincinnati has been nominated by USA Today as one of the best street art cities in the country. Um, I'm gonna place, place my vote for us, of course. And it's just amazing. We model our mural program after the uh, mural programs that are happening in Philadelphia. And it's just a joy to be here in Cincinnati and more murals, more street art means more public access to art and art appreciation. And that's the game name of the name of the game for all of us as business owners within the arts and as African-Americans making art. Wow, those are very stunning images that you've shared. And there's a lot of conversation in the comments we have two questions so far. And the first one is, I observe lots of graffiti. I rarely see it defacing street murals. Is there an unspoken rule for that? Is there any relationship between mural and graffiti artists, formal or otherwise? Either one of you can take that. <coughs> Janelle, you want to try? Looks like you're muted. You're muted. You got to unmute there. I, 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 uh, unspoken rule, yes. I've never, I'm not, let me rewind that. Rarely do I ever see um, a public mural to face, but I have seen it. Like, um, and I, and my perception is it could be one or two things. It could be just, um, um, you don't like the messaging. Like I saw a, a divine mural who, um, um, Divine was um, um, a character, um, well, really a personality, and um, she um, um, dressed in drag. I don't know if Divine was transgendered, but um, there was a beautiful mural in Baltimore of her. I'm going to say her, you know, because she's that girl, but um, it was defaced. Um, so I, I was like, well, maybe that was a hom homophobic gesture. I don't know. And then um, I saw another mural um, also in Baltimore City. I think it was I think it was off of Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and it I from my understanding, the artist wasn't from the area and that area is being gentrified. So there are I mean, real cases of um, artworks being commissioned to put a pretty package over an area that is being displaced. So it could be um, a sign of rebellion or just disrespect. I don't like the artist, so I'm just gonna tag over it. But I do believe it's an unspoken rule. Uh, I remember in my younger days, 
I remember tagging over my friend's work, like just to add to it. And he was like, no, don't you? Like, it was like, oh, God. So I, there is kind of like that respect between um, um, graffiti writers, other taggers, um, and public art in, in general. But people do, can resist the public art as well. But I, for me, it's rare when I see that. I, I've, I've seen it. Um... We've had a couple of murals uh, in Cincinnati be defaced. And actually the Black Lives Matter mural, while we were working on it, somebody spilled some red paint on the, I believe it was looking back on, I have to take a look at it to tell you, because the, the, I remember the artist, his name was Um, and he was he's a great guy. And he, he actually incorporated, it was red, like red paint, like blood red. And he actually incorporated it within the mural after it happened. He didn't wash it away. But um, that was intentional, obviously. It was somebody who did not like the message. It was somebody who uh, was caught on camera, but we didn't, you know, didn't have any, couldn't actually uh, make out who actually did it. But we did get some pushback from the various churches on that street, on Plum Street, and the various institutions that pretty much did not want it. Um, and... That's just that's just what happens. But um, yeah, I've never had any work necessarily done to one of my walls. Uh, but uh, but it is it does happen, and it's unfortunate. But you you, you have that fear. That first mural you're working on, I was like, oh my god, are, are they gonna tag it? Oh my god, you know, you'd have these feelings and, and these these worries. And then there's this this interesting stuff you can get that's about as thick as peanut butter, <laughs> called this graffiti. Uh, coding that you could put on your murals but man i mean that's just a nightmare to put on but i mean it's just one of those things where um you expect it but that's where you have the community feedback you get the community involved you get the community community painting on it you ask the community what they want to see and you just you just try to get as many people involved that to make sure it's something that they feel a part of you know i i don't my wife is always telling me Cedric, you should have one of your paintings you know, one of my abstract paintings on the wall. And I'm thinking like, uh, that could be cool, but really how does that, what, what does that say? What does that say? I mean, I think you have to have something that's timeless, something that's relevant um, and something that fits this, the landscape of where you're at and the community's wishes and desires. So mm -hmm. I think public art is, is, a, is, I get nervous when I, when I can create a mural because it's going to be something that, I hope they like, and I hope they believe in, because I not, and I need to believe in it and believe in what they want, and you know, make it happen. Why do you feel that's threatening? I would like to kind of follow that thread, and maybe take a couple of minutes for you to answer that, both of you, because if art and politics or art and voice seem to be menacing, um, Chanel talked about doing things with history. You're doing abstract things, which look kind of. Mesoamerican or, you know, continental African indigenous, it looks very, I guess, first world. So I'm wondering what is the threat in rather a one dimensional piece? It's not a robot. It's not a song. It's not a dance. It's just something visual. How disruptive can the visual be that people wanted to face? And even Mona Lisa had some, I think, was it a, a pumpkin a soup thrown on her recently because wow. of the protesting because of the starvation. People like don't have money to eat. But so they like they protest like, tear this down. So I would like to know if you know of any kind of reason why that's so visceral, that people respond to art in the static, it's just static, it's an image. It's one, you know, one dimensional, it's not doing anything, it doesn't have any mobility, but it really responds, it brings out a lot of emotions uh, from people. So if you wanna kind of think about that, I'd love to get your opinion. And then we have a question in the chat as well. If you wanna to respond to that first. Very quickly, I think people, in respects to the Mona Lisa, and the respects to uh, to one of the murals I've done, there was a community where uh, Section Eight individuals were throwing rocks and throwing stones um, and at each other and just getting wild and getting getting really wild. And when they saw that they can throw something against my my wall and my mural, uh, it became this thing where they felt the need to keep peeling and peeling and peeling. And here's the deal. If there wasn't 
I believe that would have happened whether or not there was anything on that wall or not. I believe before that mural had was on that wall or other walls in that community, there was this bad painting and peeling thing that was going on. And, you know, I wasn't offended. I wasn't at first when it happened, I was like, they're just doing it because they don't like beauty. They don't like what's inside of them. So they want to destroy it by beauty, you know, and all that stuff. But really, I now that I really now I, that's probably was like what I was going to say five, a minute, half a minute ago. But really, when I think about it, the walls are pretty jacked up everywhere and they're peeling and breaking stuff. And so that's just what happens. And, and I think people are threatened. You know, I, there's this one, I was a part of this exhibition called Gardens. And and this is this curator who who's passed, Danny Brown, he was an art critic. And he, he's a modernist artist. I'm a modernist guy. I'm not a postmodern guy. I, I care about social issues and concerns and the communal value of art. But traditionally, I like to lock myself in the studio, have my own personalized vision of the way the world should be. And that I'm cool with that. And it's, that's what I do. And a lot of the work I do tends to lean more towards aesthetic beauty and aesthetic, aesthetic charm. So, but he, he created this exhibition called Gardens. And the postmodernist view would look at that exhibition about gardens and say, not everybody can afford a garden. This is a highbrow exhibition and would see that as threatening. So it depends on the context of what you're painting and how it's being painted and what you're saying that people can, people can get offended at anything. People can get offended at you not being offended. So how do you protect that? I don't know. You just, you know, you just, you just keep rolling, you know? Thank you for that. So we have another question here in the chat and it was asking about the African diaspora. So as an African descendant creatives, do you see your practice as graphic utility before gentrification erases your body of work or do you aspire to careers beyond the plastic arts in public spaces? Well, that was a loaded question. <laughs> um, I mean, I, so I look at um, public art as um, as a living thing that is not permanent, right? Like, you know, um, as something that's going to be destroyed either through weather, through human hands, or um, just through time, right? Um, so I'm, I, for me, I'm not, I don't really hold on to it because I know if I document it really well, then I'm, I'm fine with, you know, even if you're using certain paints, it's going to fade over time. Right. Um, so, but I do believe that the work that I do, that I do, um, at, to Cedric points has to fit in the context of that in the needs of that community. So I have walked away from public art projects that were um, kind of like aligned with oppressive practices. Um, so for example, there was one instance, it was a um, 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 housing, public housing on Florida Avenue in DC and the owners, the developers wanted to commission a group of artists to work with the residents that they were gonna displace um, to create a mural. And the organizer, she said something like, oh, well, well, we'll see who's engaged and who wants to stay on the property or not. And it just felt all the way wrong. So I do think that even to, to, um, to the earlier question around defacing public property and to, um, defacing public art and is that bad or is that good? Um, it's, it's a multi-layered um, um, thing because when we're talking about the destruction of public art or people rebelling or resisting certain works of art, they may not be resisting or going at the artist, but just the system and the commodification and the exploitation of that neighborhood. So it could be that impulse, right? Um, so I, I do want to be sensitive to that, you know, um, and even if I come into a public art commission 
I'm speaking in hypothetics, um, um, with the best intention of supporting and engaging the community in which it's supposed to beautify, right? Um, if there are people that feel displaced or that I didn't capture their community memory and they want to resist or possibly destroy it, I mean, I would be, of course my ego would be offended, right? Um, but I know that there, I have to come with it Come to, especially in a black community. I think I probably have more grace. You know what I mean? I have to come with it like, okay, with a lot more empathy and understanding, right? Um, especially if I'm not from that neighborhood. Um, and, but, and the, but on the other hand, you know, if I had public works that was supposed to empower and amplify black voices, and let's say it was destroyed from racist impulses, well, yeah, I have a different reaction. Um, I'm trying to think of the second part of the, the question, which is, you know, the plastics of the public art. I think I, I addressed it the best that I could because, yes, uh, public art is a, a great practice, um, but there are definitely capital capitalist machines, oppressive machines um, that use public art um, as a tool for... Um, beautifying the the ugliness of gentrification and displacement of black and poor people. Um, so I have to be very mindful in my role as a curator, as a public artist, as an arts administrator, how do I engage with that? Because not all money is good money. I just was say that, right? So that's why it's important for me to create the opportunities for artists, um, um, other Black artists to authentically express their work um, without being messed up to other Black folk, you know. So, yeah, that that's that's pretty that's pretty pretty deep question. And I and I'm remembered a situation. There was a mural I had, and it was the first mural I did for this community. Uh, I'll just say it, community of Avondale. And it was uh, it was great. I love the mural. Uh, it, it had silhouettes of us as African Americans uh, within the mural. Um, a father and his mother walking their child to um, to the um, to the playground that was in the mural, along with the whole lettering of "This is Avondale, Home is Avondale," and whatnot. And they tore that mural down because they're redoing. They were redoing the whole new Avondale shop, shopping center. So they had me compete with another artist on the new mural. They didn't have me compete before, but they had me compete with a new um, artist on the new mural. And they had three locations where they wanted the new mural. Um, because I was working very figuratively at the time for doing murals in Avondale, South Avondale School, my mural depicted, my mural design depicted African-American families rendered in, with African-American features as best as I could render them and doing very interesting things like a grandfather reading a book. I had, I had this smorgasbord of imagery for all three murals. Well, they chose me as the artist, but there was a stipulation of, uh, because in the end, gentrification is going to reign supreme in certain situations. And I was asked to modify the design and have bring back the silhouettes. All right. So when I actually had the, community town meeting, which was pretty much just a meeting that's kind of telling the community, this is what's going to happen, whether you like it or not. I literally, and now this, this community actually just tore apart this police officer before I got up there. They ripped him apart for not having enough people watching certain areas that they asked him to watch in the last meeting. And so I felt so bad for this brother and he just, he got off and I was next. Okay. That was next and they already were hostile. And I, and as I was showing the slides of the imagery of what I had, I could hear people just saying, what is this? This looks white, this is this, 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 this not us, this is not us, this is not this. And I literally in the middle of that meeting, I think I just slapped my hands down. I was like, look, this is what they wanted to do. This is what's happening. We don't own this anymore. I kind of just went off and, uh, at the end of it, they gave me a round of applause for my honesty and my my own, you know, level of uh of me just playing the game. But 
there are there are there are important people involved. The important people involved that probably might be listening to this and might be upset with me. Who might be saying, "I'm never working with Cedric again." He just spilled the beans on everything. Or they're 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 involved because I'm being really or they're, they're understand the honesty of the fact that I went ahead along with it because it's what I have to do. It's how I eat. It's this is a reality of what's happening in our community. Um, and there's an urban league of Cincinnati where, um, uh, where the mural is actually placed and this mur the mural is beautiful. The mural is great, but I had to compromise. And sometimes that's, that's what has to happen. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it's a reality. But when you have those moments where you can express yourself and be yourself and kind of push the bar a little bit further, you go for it when, because you can. I just think artists get a lot of loaded questions like that and a lot of heat because we're out there doing that. Um, I'm not a social justice warrior. Um, I think a lot of people are so concerned about who, what, who we are or what we are versus who we are. And when you start identifying and understanding who we are as a people and as a culture, um, you start to find out the similarities that we have with other cultures and races rather than the, the differences. And what ends up happening is we get to the root of a lot of the problems of what we are or what we have. But I think in time, what I'm seeing with public art is more diversity now with black art in general, I'm seeing more diversity. I've seen, I'm seeing now the black face, the black image being culturally acceptable in an artistic format in lots of communities. I've done murals in predominantly white communities where I'm showing them the designs of people of, uh, of dark complexion with dreadlocks. They're like, people don't have hair like that in this school, Cedric. And, uh, and I, was, I was like, this is a sketch. I'm not going to make them white. Just be quiet. Shut up. You know? And it's just what, you know, I mean, it's just it's what we do. You know? I mean, it's what it is. I mean, it's the same thing as like advertisement or Procter & Gamble. You know, we need the Asian over here holding this. And we need the Hispanic over here. And don't forget the little black girls right here. But the black man's going to be right here. But not too upfront because, you know, we want to go with the whole black woman is feminine or masculine thing. We, you know, whatever. It happens. This is a job. When money's involved, it's a job. And it's what it is. So, you know, there's times where I've been plastic. There's times where I've been solid as a rock. Either way, I love what I do, and I'm very honored to have the privilege of doing it all day. Well, I thank you for that. That really does put a lot of face on how we need to crowdsource our own monies to get what we want so that the strings have less attachments to them. But it is a job and people are paying for that. I do apologize if we're out of time and I would like to thank our sponsors for this. And I'd like to thank our artists as well. Once again, we're always chasing the dollars. So you want to thank our sponsors <laughs> for the 2024 uh, Black History Virtual Festival. We want to thank both Chanel and Cedric for their sharing. They've shared their social media handles in our chat. I also want to tell you that we still have more programming coming up. On next week, we have a twofer. So on the 13th, we're going to have Afrocentrism and African-American kinship, an exploration of uh, culture on the 13th. But I can see they've gone to the 15th, the impact of arts and the Gullah Geechee community. So we look forward to you joining us again and to share this. Please support our artists. And once again, they shouldn't be starving. They're, they're bringing us all some level of consciousness. They should be able to eat whatever proteins and vegetables they'd like as well. Thank you so very much, Chanel, and thank you so much, Cedric. And thank you, everyone. Thank you for sh joining and streaming. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs>